We live in a society where the most important thing to some people is power and control. But ultimate authority and power can only be found in the name of Jesus. Have you taken hold of your authority today? Do you know who you are in Christ? Well, that's coming up next as Arkansas Live starts right now. I remember <clears throat> hearing a dialogue about a certain movie actor, and he, tell, he told the story about how someone came up to him one day, recognized him in an airport or whatever, and walked right up to him, stuck their finger in the face and said, do you know who you are? <laughs> you can understand the frustration uh, that people uh, have sometimes uh, when they're in the public, so to speak, and people recognize them. But I thought that was so funny. Do you know who you are? Well, let me ask you that question. Do you, do you know who you are in Christ? Do you know who the Bible says you are? Do you know who Jesus says you are, who God says you are? If you can grasp this revelation, it'll totally change your status of authority as a Christian. Now, for the last week, we talked about authority. This week, we're going to talk about identification and power, authority, identification, and power. And I offered you my book and workbook, Believer's Authority, to help you get this revelation. But this week, and I thank many of you for ordering this, and you can still order it. You can go online and order it. Um, but this week, at the end of the broadcast, I'm going to show you a new product offer that I want to encourage you to get. It's called how to obtain Abraham's blessing. And um, I, I think this will help you understand your authority and your identification. And I, I mentioned quite a bit about this last week uh, on your position uh, in Christ. If you are Christ, you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to your relationship with Jesus. Now, turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2. And um, let's look at verse 20. We're going we're gonna to talk about identification this week. The Apostle Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And then he goes on to say, I do not frustrate the grace of God. Our authority is based on what Jesus did, not what we did. Our healing, our deliverance, our salvation, everything that God promised to us is not based on what we do, but it's based on what Jesus did. Jesus uh, was our sin substitute. Uh, Jesus died. Uh, he descended into hell, defeated Satan. He rose from the dead, ascended into hell and put his blood on the mercy seat and forever justified those that would believe upon him. So if you've believed upon him, if you believe Jesus is the son of God and God raised from the dead, then everything that he did is now yours. It belongs to you. I tell this story quite often it bears repeating because it's a good example of what we're going to talk about. When my father died, he died in his 80s. He had years uh, previous to his death, sat me and my sister down and told us what our inheritance was. And uh, he said, upon my death, there'll be a cash disbursement out of my trust fund. And then the trust fund will be activated uh, for you and your sister and for his wife, the Caldwell Family Trust. He, my, wife, my mother had died and he had married, uh, remarried after that many years later. So he had a trust fund for his wife and a trust fund for his children. And he told us what would happen. Okay, after he died, I preached his funeral. A few months later, I think we got a letter from the trust fund saying, here's the disbursement that your father 
uh, will to you and your sister and blah, blah, blah. And uh, then explain the trust fund. I was sitting there meditating one day on what my father had done. Now, my father was born again because I led him to the Lord. But he didn't have revelation of what I'm teaching you. But he did understand, according to the Bible, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And he had taken care of that. He'd been a good steward of what God had given him, and he was passing it on to his children. And he even included in his will their children, and he included any adopted children. So he took care of everything. I was sitting there meditating on that. My father was of the greatest generation. Uh, he went through the Great Depression. Uh, then he went overseas and fought World War II. Then he came home, rebuilt America, helped build, rebuild America. And I was meditating on this, and I was so blessed at what he had done. And I was talking to the Lord, and I said, Lord, I said, I don't deserve any of this. I didn't do anything to create this wealth. I didn't work. I didn't produce it. And yet I am the heir, joint heir with my sister, of everything that my father did and accumulated in his life. And I just began to weep. And I, just, I was just caught up in, in that emotion. <clears throat> and I told the Lord, I said, you know, the only thing that I did to qualify, and I didn't, of course, I didn't do this, but I said, the only thing that qualified me uh, to be an heir was being born his son. That's it. I was just born his son. I was born into the family, and that's what qualified me to be an heir. <laughs> and the Lord spoke to me, and it so touched me. He said, and that's all you did to qualify for my inheritance, is you were born into the family. Uh, Galatians 3.29 says, if you're Christ's, you're heirs according to the promise that God made Abraham. You're Abraham's seed. You're a child of Abraham. And that entitles you, that qualifies you for the blessing of Abraham. I talk about that uh, in this book. So in Galatians chapter 2, verse 29, the apostle Paul is telling him or telling us about his identification in Christ. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Catch that. He didn't say in the Son of God. He said of the Son of God. We do have faith in the Son of God. But he said, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And in Romans, it says God has dealt to every man among you, every born again man, the measure of faith. So you have God's faith on the inside of you. And Paul says, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. This is, the, this is God's grace. Uh, what Jesus did now belongs to you. Jesus' name, Jesus' authority, Jesus' high position in heaven, everything that Jesus did belongs to you. It's not what you did. It's what he did for you. Now, how, how should this make a difference in your life? If you're struggling with sickness, disease, poverty, lack, emotional, mental stress, whatever, children, if you're, if you're struggling with rebellious children, if you're struggling in your marriage, if you're having any kind of problems, spiritual, physical, financial, you have been given authority over all the works of the enemy. And all the works of the enemy include all the things I just mentioned. Financial, spiritual, mental, emotional, family. Every time Satan attacks, every time Satan attempts to steal, kill, and destroy, you as a believer have been given authority over all the works of the enemy. You know, Jesus told his disciples that in Luke 10, 17 through 19. He said, I give unto you, talking about his disciples, 
which we can relate to ourselves today. I give unto you power, authority over all the works of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. But too many times we as believers, because we don't know our authority in Christ, we take upon ourselves the beggarly elements of Christianity. We become beggars. Uh, we become pleaders. We become appealers. We're always going to God saying, God, won't you help? Won't you please? Won't you, can't you do? And before we know it, we're just beggars. We're pleading. We're crying. And it really shows the end result is that we don't have any understanding or revelation of our authority in Christ. I'm not talking about a control freak. I'm not talking about pride, arrogance. I'm talking about your authority. Uh, how would you handle a situation uh, if the devil appeared to you himself and said to you, today you're going to die. It is your time. Your time is up. How would you handle a situation like that? Would you just say, okay, Mr. Devil, okay, uh, sickness and disease, okay, poverty, okay, whatever? Would you give place to it? Would you fall on your face and cry and weep and whatever? You shouldn't. You should stand in his face and say, no, it is not my time to die. I'm not going to die today. And you can't do anything to steal, kill, and destroy because I'm covered by the blood of Jesus and I'm an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and a word of my testimony. And my testimony is that I am the redeemed. I'm redeemed from you, devil. I'm redeemed from sickness, disease, and torment. And you just went on and on and on. Well, eventually, the devil himself would leave. He has no defense against the word and the blood of Jesus. But too many times we don't do that. We get a diagnosis. We get a prognosis. We get an evil statement. We get doubt and unbelief, and we just succumb to it. I was in the hospital the other day. I say the other day. It was several years ago now, and I was going to see someone in our church who was in the hospital, and I walked past a conference room in this particular hospital on the bottom floor, and there was a big sign out there on a marquee, and it said, learn how to cope with cancer. And I, I saw the sign, and there was a class going on in there, and I walked on by, went down the hall, got on the elevator, went up to the floor to, to pray for uh, this church member, came back down, Walked down the same hall. The class was still going on. And I thought about that sign over and over and over. I got in my car, drove uh, back to the office or home, whatever. And I kept rehearsing that. Learn how to cope with cancer. So I looked up the word cope. And the word cope very simply, generally means learning how to live with. Learning how to accept learning how to take and, and put up with. And I thought to myself, you know, I know that their desire is to help people uh, when they're shocked and afraid. But uh, again, I went back and I read uh, 1 John 5, 4, whatever's born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory, even our faith. And I'm, and I'm centered up on that word overcomes. Whoever's born of God overcomes the world. And then I ask myself this question. Would I want to cope with cancer or cope with a situation? Or would I want to overcome it? I decided that I wanted to overcome every situation that I would face in my life. I want to overcome it by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. I would rather overcome something than learn to live with it. I don't want to cope with something that I can overcome. But before you can overcome, you have to learn what your authority is in Christ. You are Christ's. You are in him. 
That's what the apostle Paul is saying here. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but it's not me that I'm living. It's not my life that I'm living in the flesh. I live by the faith of the son of God who, who loved me and gave himself for me. So let's take this thought this week as we talk about authority, identity, and power. If you never get a revelation of your identity in Christ and the authority that you have in his name, you're always going to live a defeated life. You'll always live beneath the abundant life that Jesus came to give you. Now, let's take this verse apart. I was crucified with him. I have learned, I have taught myself to do this. Anytime I'm facing a situation, whether it's sickness, disease, oppression, financial lack, the devil's trying to do whatever, I always shut my eyes and in prayer and fellowship with God, I always see Jesus on the cross and I see him hanging there and I see myself hanging there with him. If it's a physical situation, let's, uh, you could just name any number. Fortunately, I've been healthy all my life. I've never had any major uh, illnesses or sicknesses or anything to, to try to overcome. But let's just say that you are facing a major situation. I, I used cancer as an example a while ago. Uh, let's just say you have a, a cancer. And I see, I would see myself hanging there on the cross and I would see it with Jesus and I would see him taking uh, that cancer upon himself. Jesus became sin so I could be made righteous. I don't care what it is, if it's a toothache, if it's a cold, flu, uh, infection, cancer, heart disease, whatever. I see myself hanging there with him. I close my eyes and I see him in the periphery of my mind. I see him hanging on the cross and I see myself hanging there with him. And I say, thank you, Jesus, that you took my cancer. You took my sickness. You took my disease. You took my poverty. You took my depression. You took my fear. You took, and you just go down the list, whatever you're dealing with. Jesus, I, I'm identifying with you. I'm identifying with you on the cross at Calvary. You took this on yourself. Therefore, I don't have to take it. I am, I am delivered from it. I am free from that disease, that sickness, that oppression, uh, that fear, that hurt, that offense. I'm free from that. I don't have to have that. Some of you need to do that right now. See Jesus hanging there on the cross because the Bible says you were crucified with him. I was crucified with him. So whatever is attacking me, he took, he bore it. He took it himself. He took it. I don't have it. I don't take it. I don't have to have it. I'm an overcomer by the blood of the lamb and the word of my testimony. So I identify with him. I see myself crucified with him. Now we're going to read scripture that says all this in just a minute. But the apostle Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Now we know from the Bible that when Jesus was crucified, it says he was stripped naked and hung in disgrace. Oh man, just talking about it right now touches me in, in my emotion. So therefore I identify with him. I was stripped naked and hung with him in disgrace. I humble myself. I was stripped naked. I was nailed to the cross. I hung there in disgrace. What am I doing? I am identifying with him. What he did, he did for me. Paul said, I was crucified in Christ. Go through that entire crucifixion and see everything that Jesus suffered. Now, the next thing that he says, 
I died with Christ. I died with Christ. He died. I died with him. Oh, what does that mean? Uh, flip over, flip back over to Romans and let's see if I can find this. Um, yeah, Romans chapter 6, verse 7. He that is dead is freed from sin. If I died with Christ, he that is dead is freed from sin. You'll hear people say, well, I just couldn't help myself or I fell into sin. <laughs> well, the truth is you could help yourself if you would identify with Christ and nobody ever fell into sin. You, <laughs> you commit sin. You don't fall into it. But here it says in our identification with Christ, he died. Paul said in Galatians 2, I died with Christ. He died. Jesus became sin. He became our sin substitute. He was not a sinner. He died and took our sin nature upon himself. And if I died with him, he that is dead is free from sin. So I don't have to sin. You may have heard people say, well, you, had, you have to sin a little bit every day. No, you don't have to. You may, you might have, but you don't have to. If I identify with Christ, I'm dead to sin. And therefore, I'm free from sin. I, sin has no dominion over me. Uh, let's go back to Romans 6. And let's see. Um, Romans 6. 14 is where I'm headed. That's what I want to get to. Um, here it is. Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. That's pretty plain. Sin does not have dominion over you. Why? Because you are freed from sin. If I am free from something, it has no hold on me whatsoever. So you can break the chains of fear, anxiety. I've counseled people over the years, and I've, I guess a total of 37 years of pastoral work, I guess I've heard just about everything there is to hear. And I, I remember this one particular lady told me that she said she was so afraid uh, that she never left her house. Years she spent in her house. She would not go outside because she was afraid of whatever, afraid of falling, afraid of this, afraid of that. But she stayed in her house. That's a bondage. That's a chain. If you see your identity in Christ, you can understand that you're free. Sin has no dominion over you. So rejoice and thank God and command that fear and anxiety and worry to loose you and let you go. And then the first thing you need to do after you have declared your freedom is go outside. Do what you were afraid to do before. John Osteen tells a story over and over again about how he was afraid to fly. John Osteen, for those of you that are younger, John Osteen was, is, was Joel Osteen's father. And I knew John well, and John's um, testimony was that he was afraid to fly. And so one day he determined that he was going to be free from that and demonstrate Satan's defeat. So he booked him a flight. He lived in Houston, uh, from Houston to Dallas. He said, I got on that flight with fear and trembling. He said, I grabbed the seat in front of me, back of the seat in front of me and held on for dear life. It was a white knuckle flight, which means he had grabbed it so hard, all the blood left his hands and <laughs> he had white knuckles. He said in the plane, and the devil told him all the way from Houston to Dallas, I'm going to kill you. Plane's going to crash. You're going to die. He got to Dallas. They landed safely. He got off the plane. And what he had done, he had bought a return ticket. And he said, I got back on the plane, getting ready to go home, shouting the victory. I've defeated fear. And he said, and the devil said, I'm going to kill you on the way home. <laughs> the devil's a stubborn cuss. He doesn't give up. But John overcame that. He was delivered, and you can be delivered too. Now, I told you I wanted you to get your copy 
This brand new book called Abraham's Blessing. Here's how you can get it. Watch this. In Proverbs 10:22, we find that the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich and addeth no sorrow with it. Although this is clearly stated in God's word, many people, even believers, have yet to see the blessing of the Lord in its fullest operation in their life. In Pastor Happy Caldwell's book, How to Obtain Abraham's Blessing, he takes us through the word of God and helps us discover that we are the redeemed into the blessing. He shows us the connection to increase in the blessing, God's purpose of increase, God's sevenfold promise of the blessing, and much more. Pastor Happy Caldwell unlocks the revelation of this truth as he instructs us how to obtain Abraham's blessing. To get your copy of How to Obtain Abraham's Blessing for $12.99 plus shipping, call 1-800-264-2525 or visit us at www.vtntv.com. Please be encouraged to get your copy of Abraham's Blessing, Proverbs 10.22. And I expound on things that um, I, I sought for years to get a complete understanding. There is the blessing of obedience. There's the blessing of... Uh, uh, of God. There's a priest, high priestly blessing. There's, uh, let's see, uh, there's, um, oh, about a dozen chapters here. And I would encourage you to get your copy under the blessing, not the curse, redeemed into the blessing, increase the promise and the blessing, the purpose of increase. That's, we don't hear much about that. And I wanted to center up on that. The sevenfold promise, the blessing system, heaven's system of operation. Abraham's blessing is available today, and so is the book. So I want to encourage you to get your copy. I'll mention it again to you tomorrow. But now here's where we're going tomorrow, so be sure and, uh, and join me. We're going to continue, continue with our identification with Christ, and we're going to start reading again out of Romans uh, chapter 6, and find out all the things that we can identify with Christ and be free from all the things that Satan is trying to harass us with. So join me tomorrow and remember <clears throat> Jesus is Lord of Arkansas and where you're watching. your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at Post Office Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221, or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com. Remember to follow VTN on Facebook at VTN, your Arkansas Christian Connection, and follow Happy Caldwell on Twitter at happy underscore Caldwell. Today's episode is available to watch on demand at vtntv.com and click watch. You can also watch VTN via live stream at vtntv.com.